Thank you, Carol. Um, I want to start out just by uh, telling a, a couple of points of inspiration. I'll start with one point of inspiration. Andreas is uh, going to follow up with that. So just to start, I want to talk about dancing, the joy of dancing. And you probably are wondering, what do I know about dancing? Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about ballet dancing. So my experience in ballet dancing started about 18 years ago. That's me, a little more hair. Um, that's my daughter. And this was just a point in time where I, as a father, I like to think that this was an inspiration to her. She was probably two, three years old. She has become a professional ballet dancer dancing in New York. And why that's inspiring to me is watching her, watching the process has been a tremendous learning experience related to what I do. One of the things that um, she talks about, if you know anything about ballet, it's a, it's a very intense um, art, a very focused discipline, and it's all about correction. She tells me it's, it's not a good day unless she gets corrected. And that's a, that's a completely different mindset than I think I was thinking about, but it's all about perfecting your craft and perfecting your art. It's really about constant learning and critiquing, and I think that's, the, that's a, a big point, is to just understand that about a ballet dancer and, and their, their, their craft. It's also about the artistry, and, and again, if you know anything about ballet, which I've only learned through my daughter, is there's a technique that's somewhat universal. There's different variations, but there's, essentially it's a universal technique uh, that's taught. But it's, it's not about the specific technique. It's about taking that technique and then turning that into a true art form. And that's where you're going to have constant learning and critiquing and, and a refinement of your craft. And it really is about exploring through doing. If you've ever watched how they choreograph a, a ballet, the, the choreographer is there with the dancers. They probably have some idea of where they're going with the ballet. But it really is about working and, and actually exploring through doing, exploring the, the strengths of each dancer, exploring what works, and, and to truly choreographing. And to me, it really is about faith in the creative process. I, I think that's a value that, as designers, we underestimate. We, we all live in some kind of a world that has some relationship to operations, and everybody wants to kind of see what the outcome is before they start. I think as design, we have a, a real strength in truly understanding that we have faith in the process. You need to start. You need to move forward. It's a journey, and good things can happen if you follow the process. This is my daughter. She's more in the beginning of the whole process because this photo is much more recent. The thing about her in the dancing process, it's all about the basic fun. There's a little bit correction, but for those of you who have been there yesterday for the opening speech, she is not yet so much in school, so she's really into the design thinking. She's not yet linear in the way of she's functioning. So it's all about the pleasure. And especially in the industry that we will be introducing in a few minutes that we are in, automotive industry, the dinosaurs compared to the software people, many here in the room, I guess. Um, we need to remind that it's all about pleasure, having fun in the processes. Performance and refinement are exclusively there because the people like it. This doesn't solve our, all our problems that we have to solve, but if we forget about that basic thing, we're also missing out upon it. And that's something that Rob and I, in the ping pong that we'll go through now in the next half hour, we'll go through. You see it in fashion, very basic things, fun, honest, bold, very literate. Pure, redefinition of, of a purity, not too much sophistication, and a lot of authenticity. We'll come to that all later. Food, somehow the same thing. I'm based in France, the company's headquarters are in France, food is a big topic in France, sophisticated food is a big, big topic in France. And a bad news for the French people, what I'm predicting here is it's the end of the sauces and that the very pure product take over. 
and that has a lot to do with getting complexity out of our lives. It has a lot to do, I think, with what you also just talked about. It's not making the most performant software application. It's about the one that is easy, fun to use, intuitive, and that even a not so intriguing topic like taxes become actually very, very nice to solve. So it's more about the juxtaposition of the best ingredients in food or in design or in whatever else, not about mixing them and making them not recognizable in sauces. And don't get me wrong, the people who are into that, which are many in this world, they are not the ones who are low-tech or no-tech and try to refuse what's going on. These people at the same time, while preparing these very good, tasteful meals, they will be talking to Siri and probably ask for the recipe that they are just now preparing. So it's the same people, it's not different people. So it's all about giving in the very best of yourself, of the ingredients, and then adding this little bit more. And this little bit more is the intelligence, the intelligence of the design thinking. I'll only do now two minutes of what is for us here, this company, because I guess that between very few people or maybe even nobody in the room knows who Forisia is. So we feel a little bit obliged to just quickly set the scene. It's a supplier to the automotive industry, to the car industry, doing basically when you're getting your car, you sit on the seat, you're looking at an instrument panel dashboard, doors, everything. These are made by a few very big companies in the world, one of them being Forisia, being the leader there. The numbers, you can read them yourself. It's uh, 100,000 people. I think more, more important than those numbers is actually when you talk about producing some seven to eight million of seats per year, some of the same amount of or close to that of instrument panels per year. It means much more than any car maker would do. So there's a deep knowledge of the technologies, the manufacturing processes that makes us, of course, also as designers being expert. You all know very well that the big design of vehicles is always done at the studios, at the car makers themselves. So we are very much partnering up with them to get the best out of what they are doing. It's four major business groups, seating. The second one is emission control technology. It's not so design relevant. Interior systems are just the rest of the interior once the seats are done. And exterior plastic parts, like take the smart vehicle, all the plastic parts are also done by us. And basically from a high luxury vehicles on the Rolls-Royce, Mercedes S-Class level down to the Dacia Logans, everything is supplied. So all across the world, all across the segments, that's just to set a little bit the scene in which area we are operating and functioning. So just to talk a little bit more about the industry in a, a very brief way, I mean, this is kind of an icon slide, and if you don't know, this plant is a Ford plant, River Rouge plant, it's kind of famous in the US. It was probably really in its prime in the, in the 40s and the 50s. And it really is kind of an icon for me because if you see those barges, the barges would bring sand into the plant. They would actually melt the sand to make the glass for the automotive uh, windshields in, in the, the vehicle. It was all about vertical integration at that point in time. And that's probably what most people think the industry is still today. But as Andrea said, it's very much about a very complex supply base developing large modules that are robotically put into the vehicle, and it's a, it's a much different process than it, it is uh, historically. And um, I just want to show this slide. How many of you have been to an auto show over the years, anywhere in the world? And you probably have seen many concept vehicles, and this is just kind of walking through some seats, and we're going to focus a little bit on automotive seating today. And as you see, they're very colorful, they're very thin, kind of exposed uh, structural system, comfort systems. And these are just three vehicles that were at, at an, any particular auto show. They typically introduce a show vehicle. The next year, they, they bring out the production vehicle. And here are the production seats. So there's really no differentiation. And this is the a bit of the challenge that Andreas and I face. It's it's, these are, I'm sure, very comfortable seats. They may be ours, they may be our competition. They're very safe seats, I, I would be assured of that. 
But the point is, how do we tr truly cr create pleasure and value uh, within our industry? And it, it's, a, it's a challenging industry. It's challenging because the supply chain is very, very complex. And one of the unique things about us, I, I get a little jealous when Joseph talks about into a TurboTax and a brand, because we don't have a brand to leverage to an end consumer. That's a, that's a challenging part of what we do, but it creates certain muscles that we need to work differently. And I think, again, that, that brings on new challenges. But our customers, all of the OEMs, their job is based in many ways is basically to turn our products into a commodity to get lower prices. Our job is to create value so that we can create higher value for our company and, and ultimately a higher price and, and margin for our company. So it's a very challenging uh, relationship with our customers um, who are, the, are, are really what drives our business. The other aspect that is very complex is that the automotive seat in particular is a very, very sensitive safety device. I mean, it is what keeps you in place in a crash situation. So the complexity of the technical hurdles is, is a huge uh, thing to overcome. So that gets us to kind of what is it that we're trying to do within the company? What have we done? Our journey has been roughly over the last 10 years between Andreas and myself at Farcia. And we've built really two organizations that we're going to talk about today, and we've worked very collaboratively together. And this just kind of depicts that. We, we have cross-functional teams. Uh, we, we have a design process, a very iterative process that we're using. We have unique places that we work within to create a very creative environment. We do that within the context of a design thinking process and really focused on on doing and, and working very quickly. We balance between kind of a, a very performance-minded aspect and a, and a beauty um, theme-minded aspect of what we do, and we try to really keep that balanced well. So that's really about our story today. So maybe just also to add there, our two functions did not exist 10 years ago when we both uh, joined the company. So both these experts, innovation, think tanks, as well as the design team as such did not exist. There was a small make it less ugly service going on. Once an engineer had done a PowerPoint, we had to tweak the PowerPoint. That was only 10, 12 years ago, so not very much. And in the meantime, we can really say it's a very influential factor on how to drive the product plan of the company, making sure that it's a desirable employer as well. It's not only about product performance, it's also making, it, making sure that we are seeing across the world as a desirable employer. And there's all about mixing, it's all about mixing the almost scientific knowledge, belief, points of view from all the performance that Rob just uh, evoked and talked about to maintaining and creating the pleasureful uh, portion of it. It has to be liked, it has to be desirable as a product, even if it fulfills all the specification. If people don't like it, there's no point in doing it. It sounds very basic, but when you're in a supplier in such a heavy industry, heavily uh, invested industry, then you need to remind your management of that constantly. And we did a pretty successful journey in the past 10 years. I think we wouldn't have been able to do it in three years either. <laughs> So just to, this is just to show that our, our three major markets are European market, uh, the North American market, and Asia, and particularly in China. Both Andreas and I lead teams in all of those regions, as well as South America. Uh, so it is about really connecting global teams and, and information, sharing information. Our customers are global. We work on, on many global platforms throughout the world. So one of the key elements that, that brings us together is really what is our creative culture, and, uh, and I think it's, it's clearly important. You know, I, I would say that 99% of our company is very much what we would call more of a symphony orchestra. It has a conductor, everybody has their position, everybody plays their, their instrument, and beautiful music occurs, and that's pretty much a standard hierarchical organization. That's really how 99% of our company works. Andreas and I like to think of ourselves as really the jazz band. We're, we're all about a flat organization, cross-functional teams, 
We, we, we go in a direction. If it's working, we keep going as fast as we can. If it's not, we're going to change and go somewhere else. And that's, that's really the mindset and the culture that we built within our two organization that is really important to really balance a very, very heavy operational focused organization. So this is where we're going to talk about the specific organizations. So as, as Andreas mentioned, I lead what we call internally XWorks, which is really a, a, uh, um, a, a focus on innovation through cross-functional teams. And I'm going to speak about our incubation centers and our open innovation process. And then Andreas is going to talk about design, industrial design throughout the process. And we're each going to end with a, a quick case study and in the end, hopefully that all comes together with uh, some product. So XWorks, uh, we have four locations, three major locations and kind of a, a bit of a, a virtual location in Silicon Valley. But we're located in Holland, Michigan, which is not far from Detroit. Uh, that allows us to get with our customers on a regular basis. We're located in Munich, Germany, uh, and also in Shanghai. So we have very specific locations dedicated to innovation, small cross-functional teams. Really, it's about understanding the regional consumer, understanding and building connections with our customers on a regional basis, and really leveraging a regional ecosystem of, of information, whether it's universities or startup companies. Um, this, this is a, a Venn diagram that you've seen many times, but I think it's really foundational to what we do. It's, and particularly within a, a, a driven heavy indus, industrial capital industry and the fact that we are a supplier, to keep our focus on the end consumer is really a key to create value. And that's a shift that occurred within our company. And so it really is an important, important uh, part of our process. And it's really balancing that end user function uh, that new technology that, that creates value for our company and, and differentiates us, as well as aligning with our business. We, we fuel that activity really in three ways, and I'm just going to go through that very briefly, because our process has to be continually creating new ideas, new innovations in, in a very mature market, mature industry. But we do ongoing research and trends, understanding macro trends, and we do that through various methods. But ultimately, we have to then refine that to be relevant with our business and, and use that to fuel new ideas and new, new activities. We also do end user research. Um, we call it consumer insights. It's not, it's not robust data-driven research. It's really about creating power, understanding power users in a particular region and really spending time with them to understand more about how they're using the product. We've put a lot of emphasis in China as it's a relatively new market for us. And one of the things that we spend a tremendous amount of time is really leveraging outside activity. We're a small team. We, we don't tend to think that we have all the answers. So we leverage universities throughout the world, national labs, particularly in the US, um, we work with NASA, we work with uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, we work with Stanford University, we work with universities in Shanghai and universities in Europe as well. Um, we work with our suppliers, whether it's a large chemical supplier like BASF or other suppliers or outside industries like Steelcase, where we're looking at new technologies and how do we integrate those into the automotive world. Um, we work in consortiums. Um, we have a particular consortium that we're working on called Seamless, where we're looking at the Internet of Things aligned with non-competitive businesses uh, within the U.S. So Whirlpool, Steelcase, um, uh, Priority Health, looking at different industries and how do we connect all of these things together to create value for the end consumer. And we work with a tremendous amount of technology startup companies. We do a lot of, of work in Silicon Valley looking at new companies, looking at licensing opportunities, and we're moving towards some investment model in new technology companies. So taking all those ideas, we create workshops. We do workshops multiple times a year in, in our, our major locations. And those, those workshops are meant to take all of that fueling idea and ultimately turn those into projects. 
And what's unique about our process is, is we really use this as a way of getting ownership from the rest of the company. We bring in outside experts, we bring in mainly our internal experts, and help really to network those ideas and to um, really get ownership throughout our process. This is just a, one example where we take a topic like wellness, which is a broad topic. What does that mean to our industry? We do a lot of upfront research, we generate ideas, we generate experiences, and we, we ultimately develop a roadmap that we're gonna pursue from a project level. And I'm gonna walk through very briefly a project uh, that, we, that we are currently working on, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Andreas. This just happens to be some technology from Steelcase, um, looking at a new comfort system. One of the things that we, we are working towards is reducing foam in the seat. Foam is a, a basically a, a relatively heavy material. It, it's it's a, a material that's not necessarily recyclable and most of it ends up in a landfill. How do we reduce that? How do we create a more dynamic comfort system? So we have an exclusive license with Steelcase for automotive. We're looking at how do we apply that to the automotive industry. We're working with Ohio State. They have a world-class biomechanics lab. We're looking inside the body to what it's doing to comfort and, and trying to understand what does it do for long-term comfort. We start to really understand at a deeper scientific level what's creating discomfort over time. And, and this is just a quick example to say, we learned that the, the seat back was certainly creating value and comfort, but the seat cushion, there was a lot that we could do that we didn't uncover in the, in the initial phase. So just to kind of walk you through that, this is just a typical mannequin. And if you think about when you're sitting in a seat, you're, you're, you're sitting in the seat and the foam um, just compresses in a very vertical manner. And over time, as you're probably sitting in these wooden chairs, you, you, you create what we call pelvic drift. So you're starting to slouch and you create some pain in your lower back. And what we've started to identify is if we could eliminate that drift or reduce that drift, we can create a more comfortable seat over a longer period of time. So we started to experiment with how do we create a compliant mechanism that reduces foam but also takes that mannequin or the, the person and instead of just having them compress straight in the seat, they're actually compressing down and back to engage their lower back in a much more meaningful way over a longer period of time. And so here are just some quick uh, photos of kind of a, an early iteration of that product. So you're seeing how close we're getting into actually pretty scientific studies and we are learning a lot in, in those projects and we are allowing the entire organization to learn a lot about things that we are supposed to know but we don't really know. The images that Rob was showing about these concept car seats and then the, the sad reality of the normal seats that we're all sitting in when we take our cars to show that most of this knowledge is not applied if it's at all existing. So the point was then, how can we make sure that we can drive this knowledge that had been gathered and spread out through the organization, that this eventually makes it into a product that can actually end up in a car and not only in a show car. So that's where the collaboration between Rob's teams and, and my teams and the design uh, studios that come together. So we do a lot of things so you all know. I don't need to tell you what a design studio is supposed to do, making, of course, meaningful products, etc. What I'm gonna focus on here mainly is the pure aesthetical part of it. And I know that sometimes you almost have to apologize for saying that it's about beauty because it doesn't sound intellectual enough, but it's super important. So people pay more for products they like. I'm repeating this in the past 10 years since I'm in the organization. And it's surprising that it's still an eye opener, this simple <laughs> phrase, because it sounds somehow obvious. I would guess that most people agree at least I haven't heard many people disagreeing so far with that. And still, when you are at a supplier, so B2B to the car industry, mainly an engineering and production company, because the 100,000 people I mentioned earlier, most of them are not designers, unfortunately. Uh, you need to tell them what it's all about. It sounds obvious, but it has to be repeated, repeated, repeated. What am I making wrong? Oops, I did twice now. Here we are. 
So very quickly, in this collaboration process of industrial design, we do, of course, the basic creation of anti-interiors or smaller portions of it, making then the detailed definition. It's a lot about color and trim when you have a model that is global. Most cars are now developed globally. The Chinese model is very similar. The architecture is the same, but it has a little bit different skin. There's some materials, some technologies different because of a different industrial structure, because of different market consumer requirements. We all know that, but it has an industrial impact that we have respond to. Down then to perceived quality, perceived value, craftsmanship, you all know that we are accepting to wear leather jackets that look like worn out. Funny enough, in the car industry, a leather seat that looks worn out is still not accepted. If there is a, how do you say, when a, when a mosquito is, uh, how do you say this in English? Stinging, thank you. It always has to be exactly at the same place on the same seat, otherwise it doesn't work. So th there is much less flexibility of things that the same users, the same consumers accept elsewhere. So this whole craftsmanship aspect is very important down to the complete scope where engineering is involved and design is leading the activities. And we do this from very small components. I use ex the example here of an air vent. Air vents are important because they look so, so, much, so cheap, even in very expensive cars, because they are cheap. How can we make sure that those icon icons of, uh, of an automotive product, that they can slowly change, and we have good solutions for that, to larger modules like seats and instrument panels and then full interiors. We should not forget, especially talking to people who are more in software industry or even in communication devices, if you're working for anybody who is making Samsung, Apple, or whatever phones, the product typology has changed so much, and some of us are old enough, we still were dialing a number, putting a finger in a hole, and turning a dial, and then eventually we had some funny sounds and somebody on the other side of the line. The car in the past 100 years has done a lot of changes, but hasn't changed fundamentally. We still have the four wheels in the four corners. We have four or five people looking in the same direction. We still have wipers. Can you imagine something like when it's raining, a wiper? That's still the same solution for the same problem 100 years after it had been invented, or more than 100 years now. So we have to make sure that while infrastructures are making this one of the slowest industries in the world, that we are still able to keep the emotion that is linked to uh, purchasing a car. And people, they know that there is no big performance difference between vehicles in consumption, in speed, and whatever you can measure. A car is a car is a car. Of course, we don't agree with that. But in principle, for normal people, that's what it is. Um, so we have to make sure that the emotional enthusiasm with which people are buying cars, sticking to a brand, is maintained. And that goes a lot through this. So we created something that is called, that we call collections by Forisia. And as I mentioned, we are completely on the pure aesthetical side. It's all about surface technologies and decorations, not about the functional part that we do as well. This is about the portfolio of surface and decoration technologies that the company is offering. The name collections, as it comes from the fashion industry, indicates that we are renewing this every now and then, roughly every 18 months, which is quick compared to the rhythm of the automotive industry. And it's, as it said here, developed to manage these endless combinations of materials, surface textures, color and trim solutions, to cover all the requirements across all the segments, all the markets, to create also meaningful up and down grading scenarios without investing in the carrier parts, which are more investment heavy. But as much as we come from a technology point of view, all these parts that you will see now are done with a real technology for an industrial mass production, not as mock-ups. We also come from the pure design observation of trends, of materials, of things that are going on across the globe. My purpose here is not to present to you exactly what we did and what is behind every trend observation, just flipping a little bit through a few images. We created these parts. They have no other function than showing a big radius, a small radius, concave, convex, with a hole, without a hole, with an insert, without an insert, as an injected part, as a part in a formed skin like PVC slush, as a cut and, cut and saw leather parts, but also with aluminum, real wood, various printed films. We have hundreds and hundreds of those parts and can create huge walls with them. All of them are technologies where we are creating the grains, the graphics of a grain, as you see it on this picture, can be reproduced in a printed film, can be reproduced through brushing in the real aluminum decoration part. And as you know, a decoration part in a car has no other function than being decorative. There's no other function of it. So if people don't like it, there's no point in, in making it. 
We work on innovation there as well, like ceramics, or in this case, it's enamel. Where it was very interesting also to find a, a way that it doesn't look too perfect. If it's too perfect, then it looks like paint. So it has to be, have this waviness of enamel. Or once you have a decorative material, how can you decorate decoration by adding something to a pure wood? And all of this has to be going through these very tough automotive specifications. They are dropped in water. They, are, have, they have to resist scratches. There's a very strong test with uh, sun cream and UV resistance. So it's a very long way from having the idea to making sure it's doable, actually. Even when you're in a simple lower end, you're just working on paint, you can do a lot. Cut and saw, stitch lines, or showing carry materials like real wood fiber or natural fiber and pressed materials, making them visible and aesthetically attractive. A few other examples of another trend, something that somehow flips when, you are, when you're moving in front of the part or when the part is moving in front of you. The real coldest aspect of uh, aluminum materials, it's different surface technologies, real wood but reconstituted, very thin layers of wood that even in the case of an accident you don't have wood splinters in, in your body, intruding in your body, as in high gloss or matte solution. More colors in one single wood piece. Stitch lines, I'm not going in all the details, the point being that all this is a portfolio that we are offering for global harmonies. And then if you think back to what Rob just mentioned about the, uh, the very scientific approach to seat comfort, occupant safety and occupant comfort, the whole job is about aligning those two work streams that seem to be disconnected as we presented it now, but our whole point is making sure that we do connect them at the end. Carbon fiber is one of the old ones that I believe they were dead for very long as a decorative material, but with all the lightweight uh, push which is existing at the moment to get the CO2 emissions down, it's again coming as a, as a decorative material as well as a structural material. Developing also stitch lines that you would be able to find on the seat as well as on an instrument panel or door, door panel cover. Backlighting solutions. And here we come to a product that tries to get all of this into one. You see the comfort shells, these compliant shells on the cushion and on a seat back that Rob was mentioning, where we are somewhere between no foam or very little foam. So we did accomplish the job of reducing the impact uh, of foam in terms of weight, space, and also in terms of uh, recyclability issues. We we're able to create a complete new seat architecture that as such is complying with all the safety regulations. In this case, it's also a, a composite frame as opposed to a traditional steel frame while using a lot of those um, decorative technologies that I was just going through. So the whole point is not defining the one and only design that will be the future because that's not the point here. The point is opening a design freedom that in the past didn't exist. So making sure that the walk that Rob was showing earlier from all these beautiful concept seats back to those normal seats that you have in every one of your cars that we can somehow break through that with concepts that could be as strong and bold as this one or anything in between. And with this, we'll just get a quick movie running. Nope. Is it now running? No, it's not running. Can you help us?
or as you can see, coming back to the initial dancing analogy, it's all about exploring through doing. We heard about that a lot with the design thinking. It's the constant learning and critiquing. Rob said it earlier, a day where you're not getting correction is a bad day. Enjoying the basic values of pleasure, having faith in the creative process and this global creative process that we hope that we have outlined somehow, the two of us. So it's the bridge of design thinking and design doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Good morning, Stefan Kuhn, my name from Deutsche Telekom. Actually, two questions. One is more an uh, um, organizational question. You said you have a small team. Can you maybe tell us a little bit how small or how big it is and what's the ratio of designers compared to technical people and other people? And the second question is more uh, a design question. You said design, um, people are willing, customers are willing to pay more for good design. How is it working in your industry? Because the design is typically made by the OEMs. Um, they do the specifications, and then basically when there is a call for tender, it's coming down to the price. So how can you justify higher prices for better design? Thank you. Sure, when I talk about the uh, XWorks uh, teams, there are the, the three main locations in the US, in, in Germany, and in Shanghai. Um, we have teams that are roughly seven people, cross-functional teams. Uh, my background's in design. We have a combination of designers, um, engineers, somebody with a more business-focused MBA, uh, people with more consumer insights, trend research expertise, electronics expertise. So it's really a, a mix and a blend of that. Material experts, and I would say Every location has kind of strengths and weaknesses based on the talent that we, we've uncovered within those regions. Uh, so we have some emphasis in certain areas on certain disciplines and, and activities. Silicon Valley is very much about technology scouting and, and really business development activities. So that's kind of the mix. But I would say, you know, the, the part of the value is, I wouldn't say that's a traditional design studio per se, but both Andreas and I come from very similar backgrounds in our design process, product development skills, and so the collaboration is very strong between the groups. Also the design studio, to make it very clear, it's not taken into account studio engineering, modeling, and those things. We have 60 creative designers globally, which is a lot for a supplier in this industry, which is not a lot looking at all the regions, models, uh, et cetera, where we are. To your second question uh, regarding people pay more for products they like, how can we get this money back to us? Um, they, they, are all, they are all scenarios actually existing. There's the, I, I make the two extremes as, a, as an example. There is the car maker that designs and engineers everything, and we call it built to print. We as a supplier just have to build to print. That's where we get maybe a little bit involved with perceived quality craftsmanship activities, not more than that and we are stepping out of that. Otherwise, the 60 people would also not be enough. So this extreme is existing, and it will always exist. The other extreme is the car maker comes to us with a white sheet of paper and just says, we don't have the resources or whatever, or we believe that you can help us getting out of a certain situation, do the whole thing. Most of the reality is somewhere in between those two extremes. You can, again, to simplify it a little bit, the many new car makers, Asian brands, Chinese, Indians, they want the whole package. But I'm also surprised that some of the Japanese brands, for example, that have been very Japanese focused with Japanese suppliers, they suddenly come to us and say, if we want to have access to the global world of premium, we have to work with somebody else and we do the whole job for them. In this case, mainly talking about the interior of the vehicle. So there's somehow everything existing. And then regarding the cost, and which then translates into price eventually, Normally, you always, car makers always have a very limited budget for developing a car, obvious. So the more you can make sure that the desirability of your offer makes it or helps them to allocate a bigger portion of this limited amount of money, for example, to your visible parts, which are visible for the end user, for the occupant of the vehicle, rather than putting it in a drivetrain or somewhere else where most people don't care 
the better you are off. So you can still fight. There is competition for the same money somehow in a, in a vehicle development or even in the vehicle interior development. We have to make sure that we convince them. That's why I think I mentioned it eventually during the presentation. The intelligence of spending a m as low as possible amount of money for structural parts and then doing all the differentiation with as little money as possible but as high visual impact as possible, this is an important way of, of course, optimizing the cost equation. And just to add to that, I think an example that we showed with the relationship with Steelcase, that's a Steelcase patents that they own that we've licensed. We have unique patents that apply that technology to the automotive industry, the compliance shell, the cushion. We have numerous patents on, on that activity. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line between creating some barriers, um, but also offering a very competitively priced opportunity to our customers. But as Andrea said, without the focus on the end consumer, we can't create value for our customers, which they ultimately can price for as well. And that's really the challenge that we face. Thank you. We can take one more question. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for your presentation. My name is Badwin Sudens from Bialo. I was wondering um, what I saw about trends was uh, uh, partly also like a short-term thing on materials and, and, and new trends there. I was wondering how do you deal with like the longer-term developments in, in automotive like uh, you know, urbanization, uh, the meaning of mobility for people, um, self-driving cars, that kind of thing? Yeah, we have many, many focused efforts. We, we didn't focus on any of those activities, but we have very strong global activity on autonomous initiatives, um, new technology, low-cost carbon fiber. We're very integrated in new technology and how that impacts our business. Lots of studying going on on, you know, mass urbanization. What does it mean? Uh, it's pretty clear that the model shifting of, of ownership to some type of sharing, and um, all of our customers are exploring that. We're exploring that. I think one advantage in some of those opportunities is we have to study that to anticipate and to create solutions, but we don't necessarily drive that. I mean, I think that's a, a reality of our business is we have to be very smart about how we're staying very close to our customers and, and driving new technologies, investing in new technologies that will position us for the future. But we don't drive the industry to say that we're, gonna, we're going to say that everybody's going to start um, sharing vehicles. That, that will be our customers and following their model, new businesses that, that form, we're in a very good position that we can react quickly. And as long as we're very much aligned with that and, and setting ourselves up for those big industry shifts and, and positioning ourselves in that way, we can truly be a leader and, and a quick follower in that respect. You could just add, as I said earlier, that our functions didn't exist some years ago. Also, these type of questions, If I think if you had asked the same question to any foresee executive uh, 2003, 2004, the answer would have been, we don't care. We just built what they ask us to build. And if it changes, we will do something else. In the meantime, we do have these very massive efforts on autonomous driving and all these things that are at the moment going on, mainly led by our two functions, of course, but with the support of the organization. So it has become something that in the executive committee, top level of the company, is a major topic, is discussed, what is in it for the company, so we have to make intelligent decisions, which of those trends we really just observe and see what happens, which other ones we engage and anticipate already, that the day it comes, we are already able to offer solutions. I'll add one more to that, because I think it's important that we were in a position where we weren't financially uh, in a place to think about new technologies 10 years ago. Now, financially, we're in a place where we're being asked, where do we invest? We, we, we now are, are seeing a, a bottom line that has some profits. We're, we're seeing growth. Um, and it's really about where are we going to invest in new technologies? And we have a lot of initiatives focused on that to really position us for that next phase in our industry. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Let's thank them for that great presentation.